So I think we started running out of gas this afternoon. <laughs> Last session, we were heavily populated. This one, we're sparsely populated. So we'll wait until the uh, presentation comes up. And I neglected to introduce myself, Paul Gruber. Oh, wait, this is wrong. This is mine. All right. Well, you're, we're going to go with orange first. So. Okay. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Karen Nee from American University, and uh, yeah, I took notes on our discussion. So we first discussed uh, the question of in areas of severe groundwater depletion, what steps may be taken to manage groundwater, including recharge. Uh, the most basic thing we talked about was to have better monitoring because it's very hard to manage a resource without accurate information. Um, we then talked about focusing on the three R's, so reducing water use, reusing the water, and recycling wastewater, which is similar to, to reusing it, I guess, it's kind of different ways of saying the same thing. Um, and then reducing water use, we spent quite a while talking about how human behavior in this area can actually be kind of complicated. So. Um, I don't recall the name of this economic paradox, but we talked about an economic paradox where you increase efficiency and instead of using less of the resource, in the end you actually end up using more. Because that's, then That's a Jevons paradox. Yeah, there you go. Um, because people, they're like, oh, we have this extra water, we're going to expand cultivation, we're going to grow more water-intensive crops now, and then it actually can make the situation worse. Um, and there's a lot of perverse incentive structures like that that can occur. And so understanding the context in which the people who are actually making the decisions are making them and what, what influences them instead of just going from like theoretical things like if we have a more efficient irrigation system, we'll save water is good. Uh, we discussed how technological and economic adjustments can help. So implementing better technologies where less water is lost, um, shifting to higher value or um, less water intensive crops in times of drought. Um, but all of this, again, requires like understanding the producers and coordinating with them successfully and, and actually being able to influence their behavior the way you, you want, which doesn't always happen. Like if you look at the case of the drought in California, um, sometimes people do surprising things. Um, someone mentioned looking at success stories such as Israel where people have achieved very high um, productivity and returns on investment of their water by really focusing on technology and kind of trying to replicate that um, and also seeking intelligent ways to recharge aquifers looking for high permeability geologic structures that connect to them. How do we advance to the next slide? Oh. <sighs> Oh, wow. And this is not... That's, that's mine. We're, we're going one and one. Oh, so okay. I was like, I've never seen that before. <laughs> no problem. So I think the uh, first... There's a lot of similarity, again, between our discussion group and the other discussion group. And I think we started with how do we better manage demand and supply uh, what can we do to affect crop selection, irrigation efficiency, water reuse, um, and encourage more effect effective and efficient water reuse schemes and technologies? Um, engineering solutions, taking water from water-rich areas to water-poor areas was something that was considered as a way to more effectively manage groundwater. Uh, all depends on the costs associated with that. Uh, looking at what NGA can do to help out along those lines uh, is providing support for databases of groundwater conflict maps around the world. Uh, we probably have groundwater conflicts here in the United States, but we don't talk about those as much. Um, and look at Conflicts, not just from a water quantity perspective, but quality restraints on groundwater issues as well. Uh, and overall need to increase the education of uh, the user community, uh, general public, as well as the industrial and agricultural use users. 
Uh, it was suggested that we look at uh, trying to rebuild infrastructure in a more sustainable way, and that focused on things like integrated stormwater management, uh, as we rebuild communities to encourage resilience associated with climate change, how do we improve recharge throughout the area through things like uh, decreasing the use of impervious services, services and increasing infiltration. Uh, a lot of new buildings are being developed in that area, but probably not enough to have much of an impact. Uh, looking at ways to more op effectively optimize groundwater reuse and recharge, which is an emerging uh, in more emerging in more and more areas around the country. It's uh, heavily being promoted in California. Florida's been doing it for a while, and we need models to have, to do this more effectively. Um, and in areas that are flood prone. How can we encourage the use of that excess surface water to, I guess, improve groundwater storage and also look at the impacts to groundwater quality where we do have um, salt water that's encroaching on the land surface as opposed to uh, as associated with sea level rise? So how does that affect groundwater quality and groundwater use in general? That's our, that's all we can come up with today, I think. Um, okay, so then we talked a little bit about what remote sensing technologies uh, could be used to help identify and track water management approaches. Uh, our discussion on this question was considerably shorter. We first talked about INSAR, which can measure changes in surface elevation and deformation. And so if your groundwater depletion is causing subsidence, you can measure it that way. But um, we also realized that subsidence does not always have a consistent relationship with groundwater depletion. You can have subsidence for other reasons besides groundwater depletion. and. In some formations, you can deplete the groundwater and you're not going to see that much subsidence. So you kind of need to understand the geologic context. Um, and we also discussed how you can look at patterns of change in soil moisture, which can be detected through remote sensing, and use that to infer information about water management approaches. So I think uh, our discussion was a little bit broader, thanks to our facilitator. Um, you know, we, he stressed uh, several times remote sensing is not just not satellite sensors. And what can we do to encourage uh, more low-tech solutions that are closer to the ground and closer to in situ uh, monitoring, such as utilizing citizen science? INSAR seems to be the technology of choice for a lot of things, but we tried to focus on other types of technologies that can help with the remote sensing. Um, so is there other high-resolution thermal technologies, optical and radar solutions that we can uh, develop to help us better understand recharge patterns for groundwater? Uh, should we be looking at things like grid networks of sensors? Uh, again, have high schools adopt the well program? Back to the citizen science. Um, and uh, utilizing better accuracy, high accuracy sensors to send signals uh, from it in situ monitoring uh, locations. Um, can we talk to uh, well and pump manufacturers and how can they integrate uh, remote sensing technologies into their pumps that could be utilized to help with developing data for groundwater management. And then looking at phone apps and trackers for water use and conservation and raise awareness. Uh, I think there's a lot of folks that are looking at big data applications using for economic projections, and we should be looking at those kinds of um, capabilities on the water use and uh, water conservation side as well.
Okay. Uh, and the next topic was how could NGA resources be leveraged to advance work in identifying and interpreting changes in water management strategies? And uh, so we first recognize that NGA generates data and also serves as a repository for data. Um, sometimes they purchase their data from commercial satellites, um, and sometimes if the data comes from a private source, there's certain limitations on how it can be used and distributed. Um, I guess we, we discussed the need to consider the broader context and the food, water, energy nexus. So the fact that groundwater stress can often result from an increase in energy availability or a desire to produce more food to meet, um, you know, to meet people's food needs. Um, and then we just talked about how NGA's main role is to provide information to policymakers and warfighters, translate science to non-specialists, and advise policymakers, but they don't make or promote specific policies. So we started from the big picture, re-engineering ag agriculture. I don't know if NGA can play a role in that, um, but uh, that was a topic of discussion that we had identified. Uh, other similar um, discussions about NGA's role and in interface with other agencies, state and local go governments, helping to figure out better ways of reusing water and managing the water reuse activities. Um, education seemed to come up regularly in our discussions on this topic. Um, how do we think about overall water policy, educating users, not just the regulators and policy makers, and uh, need to identify what investments have already been made in um, educational resources and how to take better advantage of that. I think uh, looking at what NGA is doing and can they do to develop sensors for looking at microbial water quality globally because that has a big impact on water use and uh, trying to do more with the commercial sector um, on looking at the sensor technologies that they were developing, not all specific in NGA, but we were looking at a variety of ways of increasing sensor capability and technology um, by working more collaboratively with other uh, sensor developers, and there's a lot happening on the commercial side in agriculture that we may not be aware of. Okay, and then the last one was to talk about successful collaboration opportunities and promising partnerships. Uh, and so we were, I think we had maybe also been losing steam. I don't know. We talked about working with international agreements. There was uh, one example of a collaboration with Germany to train the scientists to produce a high-quality um, elevation data set up to our standards. Um, and also, we talked about how land use modeling based on SWOT could be used to predict how different changes in land use, such as adopting green infrastructure, could improve groundwater recharge. Um, but yeah, I think we, we mostly just focused on like working collaboratively with scientists in other countries, training them and broadening um, data coverage globally. So we took a similar approach, obviously, um, looking at transnational um, aquifers. What can we do to encourage multi-agency efforts to develop more effective treaties and water management techniques to avoid conflict? Um, is there an opportunity for an international organization to serve as a repository and host of groundwater data? Um, and thought about supporting more collaborative efforts on groundwater diplomacy. Is that an emerging area? Probably is. And uh, talked a little bit about who's the right organization to develop some of those questions and start 
focusing on those collaborative efforts. And I think uh, several folks in the room talked about efforts that are already going on with the UN, and maybe that might be an appropriate organization uh, to help develop these multi-agency, transnational boundary um, treaties and uh, management operation techniques. So I think that covers it, and I think we're ready for closing remarks. Any questions to these breakout rapporteurs? If not, thank you so very much. <laughs>